from Microbe TV. This is Twin This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 19, recorded on June 14th, 2021. <music> Vincent Dracon Yellow, and you're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Jason Shepard. Hi, Vincent. How's it going? How's everything in Salt Lake? Are you back to normal? Uh, we are. Uh, the university's gone back to normal. So the lab's pretty much gone to normal lab operations, which has been great. Also joining us from New York City, Tim Chung. Welcome back. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> nice to be back. And from Nashville, Tennessee, Vivian Morrison. Hello. It's hot down here too, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> yeah, here it's 100 degrees today. Wow. But it's only 6% humidity, so. <laughs> <laughs> it get that hot in Salt Lake City. It, 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 it rarely gets above 100, but we've had uh, a normally high June. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. not even, it normally doesn't get this hot until July. The good thing is that it gets a little colder overnight and then in the shade, because it's not humid, you can, it's bearable. Oh, it's a complete digression. When I was in Phoenix, uh, living in Phoenix, my landmate tried to convince me that if it gets above 104, you can commit crime legally <laughs> because everyone's so crazy <laughs> that they can't, uh, they can't convict you. Yeah, um, not, didn't try it though. Not sure about that. Yeah. So at Columbia, we're open, but not normal yet. We still have to have six feet between people in the labs. And um, so you're, if you have too many people, you, they can't be there still. Um, you still need face masks indoors. And in the fall, we're, everyone has to be vaccinated. And they're going to open, they're going to have classes in person in the fall. But uh, everyone has to show proof of vaccination. So we have an app that we use to get into the buildings every day. And it has now had a checkbox added for vaccination. You have to upload a picture of your vaccine card, which I have here somewhere. And uh, it's still relatively strict. And the one thing I dislike is that you're only allowed one person at a time in the restroom. So I'm always waiting to get in. <laughs> and in the era of cell phones, it can be a while, <laughs> you know? People are you mean because like, people are in there looking at their phones? Yeah. I mean, you know, before cell phones, people went in and out. That was it. And now I, that's the thing I want off. I want more, more than one person because I don't feel like waiting, right? Okay. Speaking of waiting, well, it has nothing to do with waiting. Today, we're going to learn about glial cells from Vivian, right? That's right. And uh, in the spirit of that, I have my, I know people might not be able to see this, but a cup, a mug from the lab where I did my dissertation research. And this was like a tongue in cheek thing when <laughs> Trump was in office. It says make myelin regenerate again. Because <laughs> we were a myelin lab. So the other so. side, the little graphic was a myelin sheath, right? Yeah, it's a representation of a myelin Very sheath. Very nice. Yeah. I have some viruses yeah. that demyelinate, you know? Oh, really? I'd love to hear about those. <laughs> yes. There are quite a few... Uh, and they're nice mouse models for them where you infect and the virus specifically causes demyelination. Um, but maybe at some point in the future, we can talk about those. Yeah, that would be really cool. And is it direct by like infecting oligodendrocytes or is it a kind of more indirect? I think it's, you know, inflammatory. Know. So just every, just everything. It's just like a mess. It's a mess. War yeah. zone. I mean, it's supposedly, these mouse models are supposedly models for, you know, diseases like multiple sclerosis and so forth. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, demyelination is a thing in the viral world for sure. And that's bad, as you know, for conductance, right? <laughs> yeah, we've got a large group here at Utah that works on these uh, uh, demyelinating viral uh, models. Bob Viginami, I don't know if you know him, Vincent? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I've known Bob for years. Yeah, that's right. So Tyler's virus is a picornavirus of mice, and that's one of the things it can do. And he's he's used that for years as a model. That's correct. Maybe at some point we get Bob on and talk about it, right? Yeah, I could certainly ask him. He'd be happy to do that, I'm sure. Yeah. All right, Vivian, teach us. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I just uh, want to start off by saying that, um, well, one, we're going to be talking about mice today. Um, unless otherwise noted, there's probably some, uh, you know, since I work with mice and I don't work with humans, there are definitely some differences um, there that, you know, other people in this group might have insight on t- into. But, um, and, you know, there are a couple of different glial cell types that we're going to talk about, and they just are immensely complex. I mean, just like neurons, I guess. And so we're going to stay kind of superficial because there are a lot of, when you talk about glia, there are a lot of other con- probably newish concepts that come up. Um, and obviously we should follow any little tangents mm. and you know, red herrings that come up because that's fun. But, um, but maybe we, we set the stage. So the stage is that, you know, glia are the other types of cells in the brain. And for a long time... Or rather, neurons are the other types. <laughs> for a long time, they were Just not kidding. studied at all, But even though glia outnumber neurons in the brain. Um, but there's been a resurgence, or I, I mean, I would say a surgence in... And studying glia, if anything, now it's 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 more of a hot topic than than you know just those those normal uh, uh, neurons. So I <laughs> think that it's an. Ex- I mean, and that's kind of why we're sort of you know going to concentrate on on talking about glia because, of course, as we've studied more and more about glia, we've found out that the brain requires all these other cell types um, to to function normally. But I think you know for the outside world glia is something new and um you know worth certainly worth discussing a lot yeah definitely and i also say that like you know we we think when we think about the nervous system we tend to focus on the brain and the spinal cord but there's a whole nother world outside of that which is the peripheral nervous system and it has its own glial cell types that function differently and are a completely different breed from central nervous system glial cell types so we're not going to touch on those today but you know, maybe in the years to come, we can talk about those. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're just going to talk about the three major types of support cells, the glial cells, which are um, astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, which together are called macroglia. And then there are microglia. And one major distinction between macroglia and microglia is that macroglia are derived from um, nervous tissue. They come from the same place that act, that uh, neurons come from. And the microglia, on the other hand, are peripherally derived. So they are born in the yolk sac, in the embryo, and then they infiltrate the brain in like very early to mid-gestation in the mouse. And then they'll proliferate and occupy the brain. Um, and, you know, like kind of what Jason was saying, I want people to come away from this thinking about um, the brain more holistically and or the central nervous system more holistically and understanding that it's not just like, you know, one neuron talks to another neuron, but there's a lot of fine tuning that can happen um, that is dependent on the glial cells. So like, it's like a rainforest in there. I mean, you've got all sorts of different um, types of cells that can also uh, even within one population, there can be variety depending on the location that they're in, if they're, for example, in the cerebellum versus the cortex or the spinal cord. And then all then there's interactions between that and the developmental stage of the animal and the experiences that it has and whether it's injured or healthy. So um, I guess I just need, you know, I want people to <laughs> to say it's not just about neurons. There's also these, these glial cell types. Um, so then... I want to just talk about like generally what each cell type does. So um, I would say, and I don't know if you guys feel this way, but I feel like astrocytes have gotten more attention than oligodendrocytes or microglia because of their close association with neurons. I don't know if other people feel that way, but I tend to feel like a lot of people are focused on astrocytes. 
I think microglia are also pretty hot. Oligodendrocytes are definitely not as hot. But and I guess you know one definition to, of why these cells have been understudied is because they're not excitable. So or or you know neurons were thought to be the basis for neurons were thought to be the basis for for. Um, most of the neuronal acti- electrical activity in the brain. And it's only just now that we're figuring out that actually these cell types are not as, um, you know, boring as we thought before. Not as inert. Yeah, and actually that's interesting that you say that because um, particularly in the oligodendrocyte field, there's um, there's been kind of a um, blossoming of papers that are doing electrophysiological studies Um on oligodendrocytes because astrocytes and oligodendrocytes express many of the same neurotransmitter receptors that neurons do. And um, you can actually take the oligodendrocyte population and then divide it into subpopulations based on their EFIS traces and how they respond to certain neurotransmitters. So I don't think it's clear what that means. I think people are still trying to parse it out. But um, yeah, they certainly, I don't think that they, like you were saying, Jason, they're not contributing to, like, when we study, um, you know, brain activation, the oligodendrocytes and astrocytes aren't contributing to those big waveforms that we see. So they're happening, they're, they're doing something in a much smaller scale. They they don't have their own, um, well, I mean, it, you know, there's, there's never black and white, right? But for the most part, these cells are not releasing active neurotransmitter and there's no synapses. But astrocytes have gained, you know, have a lot of attention because essentially now the models of how synapses work require this extra component of, of the ensheathment of the astrocyte around the synapse because they're the main clearers of, of the neurotransmitter or, or certainly with glutamate the main excitatory neurotransmitter, there's all these uptake mechanisms by astrocytes, of course, that are involved. And so that's why our synapse-centric um, neuroscience uh, field is concentrated right. on those cells. And it's absolutely not without reason because um, I know of at least one group that has done like postnatal ablation of astrocytes. Um, I don't know if they used like diphtheria toxin or I can't recall the method that they used, but within like an hour or several hours of this astrocyte ablation, the animals died. Like they had, um, yeah, Tim's like, what? (laughs) They, um, yeah, they had, uh, major seizures that, um, ended with them dying. Um, and I think it just illustrates how quickly, like how central those astrocytes are to maintaining neurotransmission. Um, and, you know, for example, also like during brain injury, um, disruptions that occur, we'll talk about um, next uh, with the blood brain barrier. Um, if there's actual like a penetrating injury or even just like blunt force trauma, that that disrupts. Um, astrocyte functions such that the neurons can't fire, like the ionic and osmotic gradients that are the basis of neurotransmission are all out of whack. And so um, that's been one explanation for why people lose consciousness, um, you know, in accidents like that. Um, so that that is that what Jason was saying, that tripartite synapse where you have the presynaptic, postsynaptic, and then... Um, compartments and then your astrocyte uh, involvement is really like the canonical role, one of the canonical roles of astrocytes. Um, The other that astrocytes are really famous for has to do with the blood-brain barrier. Um, And I imagine this is not a topic that is um, like totally foreign to people because, um, you know, when we talk about medicines, like that might be helpful for neurodegenerative diseases Um, there's always that question of like, can it get into the brain? And, you know, one obstacle to getting things into the brain is the blood brain barrier. And uh, astrocytes have a role in, um, in regulating the blood brain barrier. So um, in the brain, you've got these blood vessels that have, that are uh, elsewhere in the body, you have blood vessels that have like fenestrations or little windows that allow free exchange of 
um, molecules and nutrients and um, from the vasculature and into the tissue, the parenchyma of whatever organ you're talking about. Um, and some of those places exist in the central nervous system, a few, but by and large, the uh, blood vessels are very uh, the cells that make up the blood vessels are very tightly joined together by things called tight junctions. And they really prevent anything from uh, anything that shouldn't be there from exiting the blood and entering the brain. So um, it's a way to, per- to protect the uh, nervous tissue. And astrocytes are um, like in really close proximity. They're touching the blood vessels and they're, help- they're helping to regulate the um, those tight junctions and their formation and their maintenance over time and um, also uh, allowing certain things to come in while effluxing other things. Um, And so that's why I'm saying like, you know, during uh, brain injury, the blood brain barrier can be like uh, mechanically uh, altered, damaged, and uh, that this is going to lead to changes in astrocytes um, that would impact neuronal activity. Um, and one of major, major part of the blood brain barrier, the, the, what astrocytes do with the blood brain barriers control water, the osmotic balance that comes into the brain. And that's very important as we talked about before for, uh, maintaining ionic gradients that are the basis of neurotransmission. And that blood brain barrier is really, I mean, quite a, a big barrier. And I think, the, I, th- I don't think the general public probably knows enough about it, but it, that's the reason why so many drugs cannot get into the brain. Um, and, and, it, and why for neuroscience, especially for brain disorders, it's been such a challenge to, to develop therapies because most of the metabolites that are made, um, in, in, when you have these small molecules, they don't just, they don't get across the blood brain barrier. And, and so you, that's why you have, um, some of these therapies where you have to inject dr- directly into the spinal cord or the, 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 um, cerebral spinal fluid. So that barrier is super tight, but as as you mentioned, in some diseases, many diseases, in fact, as well, um, that br- that barrier is disrupted. So a lot of uh, infl- inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases, um, that blood brain barrier gets leaky. So it's a critical part of the body, and um, yeah, astrocytes are absolutely required for that. Yeah, I have some cool um, s- some cool pictures. Um, I didn't. I haven't studied astrocytes, but in my, or I, I haven't been the primary focus of my study studies. But um, I do have some really cool pictures of GFAP staining, um, where it's so that's a um, cytoskeletal protein expressed by some, if not all, astrocytes, and you can see their end feet, so their processes touching and spreading out along the blood vessels, and it's just, it's just stunning. I mean, that's one of the things that really fascinates me about glia in general is that they have these morphologies that are just insane. Uh, I mean, so do so do neurons, um, but um, they're like very um, just physical representations of their their functions, like what they're doing for for each cell and how how they're interacting with those, with whatever cell it is there. They're like big bushy trees. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and like I said, it depends on where you are, right? Cause if you're in the cortex, you're going to see big bushy trees that are like low in GFAP. But if you're in the um, white matter, like the corpus callosum, they're going to look completely different because they're, how they look is a function of what, what the other cells are around them. Um, so yeah, I think that's they're just really pretty. And actually, as an aside, there's this. Um, as an aside, there's been a couple of interesting human versus mouse studies recently, and you know we've always been trying to search well, what's special about human brains. Why why are we intelligent or somewhat intelligent? <laughs> somewhat, sometimes um, intelligent, and sometimes not so much. Turns out that exactly sometimes. Turns out it's probably not just. I mean. You know, when we look at neurons, if you if I were to look at a mouse neuron and a and a human neuron in a dish, they look exactly the same. I couldn't tell the difference. But if you take astrocytes from human human um, human astrocytes and you look at them uh, versus a mouse astrocyte, they're up to three or four four times larger. They're much more elaborate. Um, 
So, it, I, you know, that's a hot topic right now, too, is sort of what's, um, what's going on there with human astrocytes and why are they different? You know, there's like folklore in uh, that I like heard the first year I was in graduate school, which is that when um, Albert Einstein died and they examined his brain, it wasn't that he had more neurons or anything like that. It, it's that he had more, he, or he had more astrocytes than your normal <laughs> person of average intelligence. Um, which just goes to show you that they have like this, um, this role in, um, regu- like at the synapse. And so they have roles also in inducing synapses in development and throughout life and also, um, pruning synapses, which I think we've, you guys have talked about before the importance of that balance of, um, synapse pruning, um, and over pruning. Exactly. Yep. And, I, and actually, the, the sort of pioneer in this, the late Ben Barris, um, he really, you know, sing, almost single-handedly blew up that whole field and showed that um, you absolutely need these goodies that are coming out of the astrocytes uh, to, to one form you know, actual mature synapses. So it's not just these physical contacts, but the astrocytes are also making things um, that are then signaling to the neurons and tell them, okay, this is where you make an, a synapse and this this is the the right way to make a synapse. And and for a long time we didn't no one realized that you actually needed these goodies. Um, and then on the flip side, there's the pruning and the um elimination of uh, synapses and of course microglia are also involved in that in some degree. Yeah. And actually I was just thinking as you were talking, like it's interesting that, uh, I mean, I I guess it just goes to show you how important pruning is um, during development and then throughout life um, for learning and memory and a variety of things. It's so, it's so important that apparently you needed two cell cell types to do it, and they have, they do it in different ways. So like astrocytes rely on these engulfment receptors um, called MEGF10 and MERTK, and they perform like their astrocytes are non-professional phagocytes, so they can eat stuff if they are asked to, but it's not something that they really excel at. Versus microglia, which are the professional phagocytes of the brain, um, but yet astrocytes can phagocytose synapse like pieces of synapses um and and i i'm not sure about this i know that in microglia uh, microglia will also actually phagocytose synapses to prune them but there are also there's a recent paper that shows that um some non-contact mediated goodies as jason says um, from the microglia actually lead to retraction of the spine. So it is pruning in a sense, but um, but it's non phag it's not phagocytic, which I think is interesting. And I don't know if astrocytes do the same thing. I imagine I imagine they do, but um, I haven't explored that literature too much. Before you, uh, in case you move on to the next topic, I got actually something a li- for a little bit while back when you mentioned astrocyte both. Uh, being important for um, uh, synaptic engulfment and regulating things happening at the synapse, but also astrocytes being important for blood-brain barrier and the end feed. Um, are they two? Are they uh, mediated by two different types of astrocyte, or is it one astrocyte that has one hand, one arm to the neuron, and another arm to the blood vessels? Do you know? Do people know? I, I I don't know if people know, but my guess would be that. It's not two separate populations, uh, but I don't know. Jason might know more or, or he might know more about this than me. But uh, my guess is that there's a lot of crosstalk between the vasculature and the the other cell types in the brain. And so I would not be surprised if if there was. D- I d- uh, yeah, I do think the astrocytes that are directly contact the, the blood vessels are a different type. So you have these things called end feet, which is literally what what it sounds like or the the processes of the astrocyte that then spread along the um uh the blood vessel but i'm not sure whether you know where in development development's not my strong point so i'm not sure where they actually are derived from um yeah actually that's a good point now that you um mention it um they are all derived from the same place (laughs) um yeah, both in the in the spinal cord and in the brain, they all come from largely from the subventricular zone. So inside the brain, you have multiple like uh, 
rooms, so to speak, that are filled with the cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, the two largest ones that kind of start in the front of the brain and then curve backwards, um, they, those are the lateral ventricles. And surrounding the lateral ventricles, you have the, that's where like the neural stem cells reside. And um, those neural stem cells, I mean, this like, I think you guys have seen from notes that I've put online that um, I'm just fascinated by neural stem cells um, and how they decide what they're going to become because they become multiple different cell types. Early in development, like embryonic development, they're cort- they become or they give rise to cortical excit- excitatory cortical neurons um, and also some inhibitory interneurons in the cortex. They'll then give rise to oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. And uh, those glial cells will then migrate and uh, migrate out from there, proliferate, and expand their populations locally. So, you know, since blood vessels are everywhere, I think that, and the astrocytes, it, I actually, I mean, you know, it's like Jason was saying, it's, it's never black and white, so I hesitate to say, it, like, always, they always do this. But um, I, I, would hazard, I would hazard guess that... Um, you can have a single astrocyte that's contacting, you know, thousands of synapses and talking to blood vessels. And astrocytes also are connected to each other. So probably signals that are coming from one process, like from the, uh, from an end foot that's connected to a blood vessel is going to make its way to whatever neurons the astrocyte is touching or, or other astrocytes in the local network. Um, Like you can actually see if you do calcium imaging, Um, calcium signal imaging, you can see um, like a stimulus causing a a calcium um, signaling like spike in one astrocyte that then propagates through an entire network of astrocytes uh, locally. So uh, yeah, that was a long answer to say probably they're the same kind of astrocyte. (laughs) Um, So I just want to briefly touch on like uh, Two other things astrocytes do, because I do want to get to oligodendrocytes and microglia. Um, but, you know, we were talking about blood-brain barrier and, like, uh, that a lot of people may know about the blood-brain barrier, at least kind of, you know, in some kind of hazy, hand-wavy way, because we know, like, it's a problem getting drugs into the brain. Um, so something else that people might have, like, a hazy, you know, yeah, I've heard of that before feeling about is the glial scar, and it comes back to, you know, the, when we're talking about uh, nervous system injury, like penetrating wounds, uh, TBI, things like that. Um, astrocytes, as well as the other, as well as oligodendrocytes and some other cell types that are not neural in origin, they generate this kind of like fibrotic casing around wherever the injury is. And like many things in um, in the brain, and especially like microglia, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, in one way, the glial scar can protect the normal uninjured tissue from the inflammatory soup that you find in the middle of the lesion, which they have found if you ablate astrocytes and thus prevent the formation of the glial scar, the damage that is done by an injury is actually far larger than if you left the glial scar intact. So it's positive, but it's also negative in the sense that, you know, it may provide a barrier to regeneration. Like there are many species where we know that they're able to regenerate neurons, like regenerate whole limbs even. And so I think we're always trying to understand like what is it uh, like about us that prevents that from happening. Um, And so I think people think about the glial scar sometimes as being one of those obstacles. However, I think there's some, there is some uh, more recent, um, data showing that astrocytes can actually create bridges through um, through a lesioned area and through the scar to help guide uh, regenerating axons, which is fascinating because uh, it makes me think of the peripheral nervous system where you have another glial cell type who is very well known for doing that, creating these kind of trenches that will guide peripheral neurons that are regenerating um, from the, you know, basically where the cell body is through whatever, wherever the lesion was towards its target. Um, so I haven't read as much about those astrocyte bridges, um, but I'm 
really, in, uh, that's something that's new to me and I think is really, really interesting. And if we can learn how to leverage that or facilitate that in a way without, you know, getting rid of the glial scar, maybe we can improve outcomes for people who have traumatic brain injury or, you know, spinal cord lesions. And then finally, I'll just say, this is another thing that I think is um, kind of fairly well known by people, by neuroscientists, but um, astrocytes are like also like oligodendrocytes, they uh, help support neuronal energy metabolism. So they have a very important role for taking up glucose because they have this tight uh, tight connection with the vasculature where you're going to find glucose. It can take it up, store it as glycogen, and then it can actually transform it and and give um, give it in the form of lactate to neurons. So uh, you know we know n- neurons use like some ungodly proportion of the sugar that we consume and um, and they just want more. And so the astrocytes are there to help make sure that th- those neurons are getting what they need. Those prima donnas are getting what they need. Uh, but they're, they're not alone. Yeah, I, I was always fascinated, fascinated by that because I didn't know, I, I think I didn't really know or appreciate that until the last sort of um, studies that came out showing that you absolutely need this lactate from astrocytes for learning and memory. And then you delve into the energy homeostasis and neurons and it's a complete mess because they don't have half the things that other cells have. And so it's almost like, you know, these neurons or as you said, the prima donnas, they are um, constantly being looked after by the astrocytes. And if you don't have the astrocytes, then you they, they, they can't do anything on their own. Yeah. And that's actually, it's funny you say looking after, because I was writing in my notes, like I like to come up with kind of like little analogies like, oh, microglia are like the garbage man that's moonlighting as a first responder, you know? And like the astrocyte to me is like the overseer. It's like the, um, the governess, you know, cause it's like making sure that it's, you know, the neurons got all the, you know, all the calories it needs. But it's also at the synapse, it's checking levels of neurotransmitters and being like, do we need to fine tune? Is there like way too much going on here? You know, so it's really just it's like surveying what's happening with the neuron at all times. They're like the admin support for our labs that we never talk about, but absolutely require for making anything happen. (laughs) Yeah, or like grant submissions, you know, you're like. Where's, you know, where's that person who's going to make all my, you know, who's going to get that grant submitted um, that you're like, don't think about until like that deadline is bearing down on you. It, it's become increasingly um, clear that many viruses that cause brain injury and, and in particular the ones that we've always thought uh, infect neurons and, and cause paralysis or other diseases. Some of them actually infect astrocytes too. And when a virus infects an astrocyte, the astrocyte responds by making a a large number of inflammatory uh, molecules. It's kind of a defensive reaction, right? And some of those can actually damage neurons and cause the apparent, um, you know, in the case of polio, we have a mouse model using a a mouse-adapted polio virus where the injection of virus into the brain causes paralysis, but the neurons are not infected. It's the astrocytes, which then produce substances that destroy the neurons. And we're, we're trying to actually un- understand what those are. And other viruses, West Nile virus, uh, Zika virus, all infect astrocytes, and probably that contributes to neuronal damage. So it's not as straightforward as we always thought it was. Right, right. And they're everywhere. You know, the astrocytes are touch. Oh, I just mean like the astrocytes are, uh, there is like no place where you're not going to find astrocytes. So it's. Um, uh, are, are they in the spinal cord, actually? I didn't know whether yes. they are. Okay. Yes, astrocytes are in the spinal cord. And it's actually, int- it's, oh, it's maybe not surprising, but similar to what I was describing in the, in the brain where you have the subventricular zone that gives rise to multiple cell types. So you have a, a similar thing going on in the middle of the spinal cord surrounding that central canal where you have, uh, you know, a, a purportedly homogenous group of stem cells, although there's a big asterisk there in my mind about that homogeneity, um, that then gives rise to oligodendrocytes and astrocytes and neurons as well. But I mean, like, yeah, if you were a virus and you were like, how do I get to the most stuff as possible all at once? 
like I said, those astrocytes are all connected to each other as well. So it's a, a great mechanism for traveling, you know, traveling long distances, I guess. And of course, um, astrocytes, just like other glia, are, are dividing cells, so they can still divide. And so they're also a, a large so, a source of, of um, brain cancers, uh, abnormal brain cancers, or because you have glia, uh, gliogenesis and abnormal proliferation of astrocytes, even um, in adult tissue. Um, but they also act as reservoirs, so like retroviruses, right, um, Vincent? So HIV um, preferentially uh, goes to microglia because they're kind of like immune cells and they express the receptors, but they act as reservoirs because they, they don't get cleared out. Um, and so a lot of the, I guess, the ideas about latency and where there's pockets of viruses that, that don't get um, cleared out by antiretrovirals um, – antivirals uh, are in the brain, in the brain uh, cells. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say HAND. Isn't that an acronym for um, something related to that? (laughs) Um, But actually, so let's let's start talking about microglia since we're in this kind of like uh, immune situation. Um, So microglia, I think, like Jason said, they're they're super sexy right now. Um, I mean, because... um, you know, they are showing up in places that we never thought they would be in. So we, I think a lot of, or I don't know if a lot of people, um, definitely all of, all of us neuroscientists were like, okay, microglia, inflammatory cell type, immune cell type. And it's true. They're derived from the same lineage as our peripheral macrophages that can, who are the, you know, primary cells that are engulfing things in tissue and then taking them to lymph nodes and saying, hey, I found this stuff. Do you want to do anything with it? Like, so microglia do serve that role. Um, And uh, they're, so they express a lot of receptors that allow them to recognize um, RNA and viral proteins and bacterial toxins. Um, And then they have the machinery to phagocytose this debris. And um, it turns out that this ability to phagocytose stuff is important not only for, you know, in response to a pathogen or in a situation where there is injury. And so there's a lot of like debris from dying cells that needs to be cleared away. But it's also important for development coming back around to a similar role that astrocytes play, and that is in pruning synapses. They also help to establish synapses, although I don't know as much about that. Um, but, for example, um, if you ablate uh, microglia, and um, it will decrease spine formation during development. And in the adult, when you're trying to teach an animal or they're trying to perform some learning task, if they don't have microglia, they can't, they can't create the synapses or potentiate the synapses that are necessary to make those memories and learn the task. And actually, what's super interesting about that is that if you they the paper that was looking into this showed that you could recapitulate this finding by not by depleting BDNF, uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor from microglia specifically. I think there's still a lot to figure out there. Actually, um, Mario Capecchi, who's uh, here at Utah, found this weird subpopulation of microglia that if you just ablate them and they have some sort of different origin and i can't remember exactly how um what that origin is but they stumbled on it because they were deleting this uh hox gene which is normally a a, a major player in development of of um how things form and and, and organs form um but surprisingly what they found was then they deleted this hox gene it got rid of the subpopulation of microglia and the brain kind of looks normal but these mice grow up to have OCD and a very sort of stereotype kind of behavioral phenotype. And so to me, that was also fascinating because um, it suggests that you, as you, as you just said, that you need these cells to actually have a normal wiring plan of the brain, but it's not at all clear what they're doing and why you um, have such a specific subpopulation of microglia that can um, be, that are important for this one kind of, uh, you know, phenotype. And actually, there's um, a couple of papers that have come out recently that have done single cell RNA sequencing of microglial populations across 
Of course they did. And it, as we've talked about before, it's just like you just vomited all this stuff out here. Now what are you going to do with it, you know? Um, and it's difficult to handle. Like I am, I'm currently like, I'm, I love that they're available that I can be like, Oh, I wonder where this is expressed. And I can just go search. Um, but then I'm like, okay, I know that it's differentially expressed in this, at this time point versus this time point. Now what? Um, but yeah, they've like, there's, there's a ton of different microglial populations depending on where you are in the brain and then also how old how old the animal is um and uh so it's just like i'm i guess i'm not surprised to hear that there's this other this like subpopulation that serves this this particular role um and even in the work that i'm currently doing in my postdoc we're we're looking at how microglia in the subventricular zone are are impacting neural stem cell function um and how, but it's just that population. They're different. Single cell RNA sequencing studies have shown that there are microglia in that region that they're called pro, uh, proliferation, proliferation, proliferative niche or proliferative zone associated microglia. And they're very similar phenotypically to disease associated microglia that we see in neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and Huntington's. And that's actually another reason why they're so hot is because um, there was this big surprise from the, the, the human genetic studies when they were looking for these uh, genes that are implicated in Alzheimer's. And um, a whole bunch of them uh, are not expressed in neurons. They're only expressed in microglia. And this was a big surprise because, again, um, the field had been dominated by uh, folks who are obviously looking at neurons dying and and synapses being lost, um, but the fact that the genetics was actually now pinpointing this whole other cell type to be involved in the disease pathogenesis was complete surprise, and that that I think is still going to be you know a huge contributor to uh, therapeutics down the road. And I guess we probably shouldn't talk about the the new new biogen thing, but that's another you know discussion on. Um, for these diseases, uh, have we been looking in the wrong places because we've been so centric, um, so essentially focused on neurons and and not these other cell types? So there's a huge ton of work now being done on microglia in the context of uh, Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative disorders. Yeah, and actually, I, we just did. I'm part of an Alzheimer's disease journal club here at Vanderbilt, and um, we discussed a paper a couple of months ago. That, um, you know, we think about, you know, in Alzheimer's disease, you have these extracellular protein aggregates that um, are pathognomic of the disease. And we've, you know, thought of, we, it's been the kind of like thinking that microglia are attempting to clear this stuff away and engulf it and protect the neurons. But this paper actually suggested that the microglia take up the soluble a beta peptides and are actually contributing to the formation of the plaques. So, um, and that was not, it was, I don't think that they were necessarily seen as being drivers of plaque formation, that rather we thought about them as um, attempting to um, mitigate those plaques and clear them. But instead, it seems like maybe they could be driving some of that. Well, actually, I, I think the um, what's emerging now is that for the long time again, we thought, okay, these plaques and these um, uh, these plaques were bad for the brain. Um, but I, I think it, it, it's sort of emerging now that it, that the plaques are actually a way of sequestering uh, the toxic oligomers and species of proteins, misfolded proteins that were killing the cells. So even though the plaques ultimately are are bad because they're a physical barrier to you know they're 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 not supposed to be there, but they're actually protective. Um, and so then the alterations in microglia, where you know, so essentially the microglia are the garbage disposable you know disposal of the of the brain. Um, and if that garbage garbage disposal is not is clogged and not working, um, that's when you get these these species becoming really toxic and killing cells. But the plaques themselves are actually 
somewhat of a manifestation of the uh, good things that they're doing. And so this idea, well, going back to Bayanshin, because this idea that you're clearing out the plaques in and itself is not really, you know, so that was the goal for many of these therapies, but it turns out that may not be the right endpoint that you're actually trying to uh, reach because those, um, those plaques are actually protecting somewhat against the initial, you know, toxicity that's going on. Yeah. I think that, um, I'm kind of fast. I'm interested in this idea that uh, many of the diseases that we think of or that are neurodegenerative are actually beginning with dysfunction in glia. Um, so I had this crazy idea, and I think there was a, there's another paper that um, that kind of theorized about this that um, in multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease that um, affects myelin, where the immune system comes in and recognizes myelin as being non-self and starts to destroy it. Um, it's not clear if multiple sclerosis be- is beginning because something outside is a uh, is happening in the in the periphery. For example, I think there are some viruses that produce. Uh, that have have uh, proteins that are similar in structure to some of the myelin proteins. So um, we're not sure if there's something happening on the outside that is a that is then um, saying, "Hey, let's go into the central nervous system," or so that would be the outside in theory. And then there's an inside out theory, which is that there's some dysfunction in some cell type in in the brain or in the spinal cord that is drawing the immune system in. And um, microglia actually specifically, they're the only ones who will take this up, although all cells in the brain are able to um, take up exosomes, which are these small vesicles that are secreted. Microglia are the only ones that will pick up these exosomes that are secreted or, um, yeah, secreted, we'll say that, secreted by oligodendrocytes. And those exosomes contain the contain myelin proteins that a lot of people who have MS have antibodies towards. And um, so the kind of idea is that the microglia are supposed to be taking up these exosomes, which may have some other signaling role, and they're supposed to be degrading them and like getting rid of them. But, you know, maybe they're not able to do that as well. You have an accumulation of ex- myelin protein containing exosomes in the extracellular space, which we now know can be drained into um, into lymph nodes. The and, and that maybe, you know, it's this dysfunction in microglial phagocytosis that is, is in some way priming uh, the nervous system and the immune system to develop multiple sclerosis. And of course, there's you know, everybody's MS is different. It's kind of like cancer. It's, you know, not like there's a single phenomenon that's causing it. But yeah, this idea that um, microglial dysfunction with age or in a given um, genomic context could be the primary driver of neurodegenerative disease. Yeah, actually, my lab we're 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 fascinated by this because we're we stumbled on these extracellular vesicles. Then we're actually looking to see if if neur- neurons, the, the vesicles that are coming out of neurons, are taken up by microglia and um, both in a normal context and as well as in a, in Alzheimer's. Um, and I think you know it also does pinpoint that these these glial cells and microglia, especially, are the nexus. Um, going back to you know these diseases and um, what viruses are doing. Uh, all the cytokines, these inflammatory signals, most of them are actually being produced by these glial cells, and so the trigger point could really be these cells. And and so then you've got the the this is where the environment comes in. So you know you've got some obviously genetics that pinpoint specific gene variants that people have, and that predispose you to the disease. But you need the trigger. The trigger has to probably come from the environment in one way or the other. And and so there's this emerging idea that, you know, viruses, fungi, bacteria, any of these sort of um, uh, inflammatory induced uh, changes in the brain uh, trigger these glia cells and then they sort of go haywire. Yeah, it's a funny thing, actually, with multiple sclerosis. I think it's like if you live in the northern hemisphere, your risk of developing MS is like significantly higher than if you live in the southern hemisphere isn't it that linked to like vitamin d and the lack of sunlight uh, yeah, i mean yeah i think that's the argument but i mean if that were the case couldn't you just dose everybody with vitamin d and they would all be better 
Isn't that also something about what you know that we're just too clean that we're um, we don't you know that basically all these autoimmune disorders are higher. There's a higher chance of getting them in uh, in, in cities and whatnot because we, we we're not playing in the dirt basically. Yeah, yeah. It's my dad always says you gotta take the kids out to a farm and like roll around in the mud with like you know um, cow um, excrement. Uh, <laughs> called manure right right i was like the only word i'm thinking of i probably shouldn't say um my microbiome yes their microbiome yes exactly i've been been, uh i've been shoveling manure all weekend so i knew the word it was on the tip of my tongue (laughs) (laughs) wait no way (laughs) no i buy manure for the bloody garden man (laughs) (laughs) best fertilizer you got you can get you know it's really good fair enough fair enough True, true. But on that on that note, is it known within developed country where it's pretty hygienic, where the people who do work for in agriculture and therefore have more contact with animals are less likely to develop uh, degenerative disease? Because some farmers are actually more likely to develop Parkinson's disease due to the use of pesticides. Um, but perhaps there's an equal down... Uh, for for MS and and other stuff, I don't know. Just wondering. I didn't thought of that. I never thought of that. Yeah, that's interesting. I think uh, there's a meta analysis coming on. I can feel it. <laughs> or zookeepers and and uh, animal husbandry husbandry people and people who work with mice, perhaps. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was a study showing that that if you have pets, and especially dogs, you do live longer. And the, but you, you know whether that's because you 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 know you have your emotional support, or whether they actually give you more. They, they're they're dirty, so they 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 uh, come in and you know you get their bugs through them. I don't know. <laughs> It's so funny, like, um, so we we have a dog. I've never owned dogs before, but we got a dog, uh, just, re- you know, COVID dog, COVID puppy. And um, it's so weird. They really want to, like, lick your mouth. <laughs> like, when you go give, it's like, you you could do it on my cheek or literally any other place on my head, but they, they want to go for your mouth. And I'm like, what is this? They just must know they're doing us a favor. That's right. Yeah. By, you know, transferring whatever they got. Um, speaking of transferring, um, that was a really weak segue into all good endocytes, um, which are my passion. I'm, am working with microglia and, um, with in my postdoc working with microglia and some, um, non-neuronal cell types, which I hope at some point we'll be able to talk about, which is basically just blood vessels and the cells on blood vessels. But, um, serendipitously, my project now also, and my Um, is about oligodendrocytes, which is what I studied um, in graduate school. So um, oligodendrocytes are mainly known for their role in myelination. So as I said earlier, I like to give names to these cells, you know, little analogies, and they're basically like glorified electricians because um, they're creating insulation and they're wiring up and connecting um, different networks of neurons through myelin. So um, if you think about the brain as being a jumble of electrical wires, um, some of them have long distances to travel. And just like we, you know, those big cables that go under the oceans to connect different continents, those need to be, that's a long distance and there's a lot of pressure. And so those cables need to be insulated and we need the same thing in the nervous system. For the longest time, I didn't realize that it's important in the brain because unlike just a wire in the air, our brain actually is obviously inside, you know, extracellular fluid and, you know, uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And that's essentially salt, like salt water, which conducts electricity. And if you don't insulate those things, it, the, the current's just going to leak out everywhere. Yeah, and that's exactly what myelin does. Um, so during the process of myelination, an oligodendrocyte, which has, um, you know, all of the, I don't know, it's funny, oligodendrocyte, it's like oligo means many and dendrocyte means like branches. And I'm like, all the cells have many branches, like astrocytes, microglia, neurons, they all do. Um, but they, you know, oligodendrocytes have very special processes, very special branches because they um, will reach out and they'll um, make contact with the neuron and it's not, it's, you know, that, and it will decide, oh, I need to myelinate this axon. I need to wrap myself around this axon. And we're not sure what that signal is. It's probably a kind of a 
confluence of different signals that you know stop go signals and um wait so those signals are not i thought oh wow i thought we knew that <laughs> it's no no i mean there's definitely like um you know uh neuronal activity seems to stimulate um myelination um but you know there's some nuances there you can make oligodendrocytes myelinate inert nanofibers like carbon nanofibers so it's also dependent on probably the size and the kind of topography of the axon um it's yeah it's it's also dependent on like the number of axons that there are it's not clear um in i think in general we think uh, in general there's not a like there's not a how to say this. It's more like there's a removal of an in, of an inhibitory signal that seems to drive myelination more than like a a go signal. That's kind of like the general thinking. But um, if anybody says that like this is the one, this is the one driving factor that says if a myelin sheath is going to form or not, I would not believe that. Um, but so it will the oligodendrocyte reaches out to the axon and it starts to wrap its arm around the axon and it starts to it's like pumping all of this lipids and proteins into this process which then starts to grow from the inner tongue and spread out along the axon um and you'll have multiple these are called myelin sheaths and you'll have multiple sheaths at different places along an axon and in between those axons you have the nodes of ranvier which are where we have the sodium channels clustered and um, that is where the action potential, which is the basis of neurotransmission, is regenerated. And that's like what Tim said. If you don't have those myelin sheets, if you're going a long distance, you risk losing your signal. You risk losing those gradients that propel the action potential forward. Um, so that's what they're what they're known for. Those nodes are kind of, I think of the nodes as being like the, you know, the big, to- the electrical towers that you have for the wires. So without those electrical towers to, you know, propagate the signal, um, you're, you're going to f- lose it very quickly. And so they help propagate the signal. I think we could, and we can take, this is where things get really interesting with myelin is that you can t- go a little bit deeper and start thinking about like how long, are the myelin sheaths and where are they along the axon? Because um, Jonah Chan's group uh, out where Ori is or will be soon showed that in a, um, they did some sparse labeling of cortical neurons. And we just kind of always assumed that like a myelinated axon from its axon hillock all the way out to like the end would be myelinated. But in fact, it isn't. It's maybe got like a couple of uh, myelin sheaths here and there, and they're not the same size. Um, and it's unclear why. And, um, I, I, there's, this is a difficult thing to study. I think it relies, you would have to rely on, uh, on modeling a lot, but, um, trying to understand how the placement of myelin sheaths and their own properties, like how thick they are, how long they are, how close they are to other myelin sheaths that can influence plastic spike timing, uh, uh, Plus spike timing dependent plasticity because it can control how quickly the action potential goes through certain parts of the axon or like at a branch point. How is that going to impact the tran- the signal? Yeah, there's been um, a couple of papers from, uh, well, one from Paul Franklin's group uh, in Toronto showing that there's experience dependent changes in these myelin sheaths that are required for learning as well. Uh, and to me, that blew my mind because I'd always assumed that these things are structural. Like it's basically, you know, you need them, you absolutely need them and you can't change them. Otherwise you're going to have complete um, abnormal wiring of the brain, but apparently they're plastic as well. Everything in the brain is more plastic than we thought it would be. I think one story I heard that sticks with me is that uh, people who play the piano, so use both their hands a lot, have much, well, maybe not much, but definitely thicker corpus callosum, which is the myelin well, myelin plus axon that joins the two sides of the brain together. So that does suggest using uh, learning affects myelination. Yes. And they've actually, um, they've done this with humans and um, there's a method called fractional, well, it's, um, oh my gosh, tensor diffusion imaging. This is not something I do, but uh, you can, and you can basically 
image these big axonal tracts and get a sense of like um, their water content, which is used as a proxy for myelin. And if you have people, if you, you know, bring people in and you teach them how to juggle, you can see myelin changes happening in their motor cortex over the course of learning how to juggle. And the same thing happens with um, like violinists and pianists. You see those myelin changes. And um, yes, and then there was, uh, there's another group that showed that if you teach, if you, um, you have a mouse running on a wheel, and then if, you know, they're very good at that. But then if you take out rungs at like um, strange intervals, the mouse has to learn, has to relearn how to run on the wheel. And you can't, the, the mice cannot do that unless they have new oligodendrocytes that can make new myelin, um, which is just getting back to what I said, like it's, there's some connectivity stuff. And this is again, like I'm a cell biologist, so I don't really have the tools to do this, but I wish I did. And, you know, maybe when I'm a PI, I'll make that jump to, um, to whatever field that is, but, um, <laughs> Neuroscience. <laughs> that there's the myelin. <laughs> no, I know, but you know, people are like, Oh, I was a cell biologist. And then, or like I was a, you know, molecular person. And then I went to do this, you know, I, now I do modeling. Um, but, uh, yeah, that there's connectivity is dependent highly on myelination. And there could be little minute changes, like um, apparently that the myelin sheath will swell briefly as an action potential passes through it. Why? What is that doing? <laughs> um, so there, and then you can have changes of the size of the myelin sheath, and that also will impact um, action potential conduction and timing. How do they even see that? Uh, you know, I couldn't tell you exactly how, um, but you know, there are actually a lot of imaging techniques that just use the kind of optical properties of the fats to see it. Um, so that really opens up visualization um, opportunities. Um, one little story that I thought was fascinating um, in like barn owls. Okay, so we have our auditory neurons ha are myelinated and you know we have you have to get signals to the same part of the brain from two different ears that are like different distances from that that uh, part of the auditory brain um, auditory cortex and myelin can help those two signals arrive at the same time so that you can localize the sound so this also has happens in other animals and in barn owls myelination is not complete in those um, in those tracks until the head has reached its adult size, then it stops and it locks everything in because once something is myelinated, um, you can't new synapses forming. It's like much less uh, less plastic there, so you kind of have you're maybe reducing neuronal plasticity, but you will then have the ability to still be plastic through changes in myelin. Um, so that's what they're. That's what oligodendrocytes are known for. Um, and they also, you know, they also, like astrocytes, will provide uh, energetic support through lactate shuttling um, to neurons. Um, and there's just, I, I probably should just stop here because, like, I will just keep talking about all the amazing things that they do. Oh, God, I have a quick question. Um, uh, if, if not just the amount of myelin is important such that, you know, if you don't have myelin, you get multiple sclerosis and that's bad. Um, it sounds like the precise amount of myelin is important because it governs the timing of when the electrical signal arrives at different parts of the brain. So are there diseases associated with too much myelination? You know, I'm not familiar with uh, like hypermyelination, and I will just say that um, in in multiple sclerosis, the nervous system is is normally myelinated. It, it is it is myelinated in a normal way until the the immune system starts to attack it. But there are diseases where um, the myelin there's either not enough myelin, so a hypomyelination phenotype, or a dysmyelination phenotype where the myelin um, structure is not that stable, and so it can degrade over time. Um, but I'm not familiar with any hypermyelination phenotypes in humans, although that is definitely something that we do, do see in mouse models when we're trying to understand what, like we were talking about with Jason earlier, like what's the what's the signal that says myelinate or don't myelinate? Um, we try to get 
hypermyelination to see like, okay, what's driving it, you know? And then you maybe you're looking for hypomyelination to say, okay, what's the signal that is, um, that's really saying, stop, don't myelinate me. Um, but, you know, I think there are, I, I don't think we know the an- really anything about what you just asked, <laughs> in essence. Um, I think there's a lot left, a lot, a lot, a lot left to learn about how myelin and its patterns work on like a micro scale to uh, regulate connectivity. I would also quickly point out last week we talked about uh, uh, catnap 2 knockout and autism disorder and the vagus nerve. And Vivian, you noticed that catnap 2 is actually coding for, I guess, the protein called Casper, which is which is part of uh, all the, uh, Schwann cells or, or is part of the myelin either in the periphery uh, or in the central nervous system. I can't remember which one. Yeah, it is in the central nervous system. I believe it, it's expressed by neurons, though. It's not an oh, all okay. protein. Never mind. Think. But but in any case, it is necessary for forming the um, those like paranodal regions. Because uh, I, I looked up. Ah, oh, I see. I see. Because I looked up the vagus nerve, and it's actually myelinated, which mm-hmm. I didn't know. So mm-hmm. so maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so the vagus nerve uh, is a is myelinated is myelinated by Schwann cells. Ah, okay, it's okay. Peripheral nervous system, but um, yeah, the Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes come from two different places, but they have this kind of convergent evolution because myelin is so important. Um, it's also interesting to note that the uh, appearance of myelination in like the phylogenetic tree happened when things that lived in water started moving onto land, which, you know, people theorize has to do with, you know, reaction times or I don't know, like being in the air versus the water. I don't know. But I think a a lot of interesting biology evolved off the fish came onto land. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So much, so much. Um, but I'd never thought about that. Um, I mean, and there's myelin, like there's there's in sheathing like cells in in things that live in water. <laughs> so, <laughs> and zebrafish, for example, they're uh, heavily used to study myelin. Well, that should be a nice uh, background for when we start doing papers on these cells, right? Mm-hmm. I hope so. Yeah, I think the bottom line is that there's a lot to know, a lot to figure out about these other cell types because they have been understudied. And, um, and the, the sort of, uh, you know, focus on neurons has now sort of been, uh, taken away a little bit, but for good reasons. Right. And it all works together. You know, there's, without the neurons, there's no point in having any of the other cells. And without the other cells, the neurons can't function. So, you know, the, the ecosystem, I mean, it's an ecosystem and all the parts are important. And I think that it's very easy for people to think about the brain just in terms of neurons. And it just does a disservice to to these other cell types, which are just fascinating. And um, have a lot of, it's a lot of stuff for neuroscientists to play with. You know, I wake up and I'm like, man, what am I going to learn today about glia? Like, what new, what new frontiers are there for us to discover? So it's um, pretty exciting. Is there any organism that, say, has neurons and nothing else? We always have to have neurons and glia. Ooh, I don't know. I think it's mostly you got to have both. <laughs> but I... Yeah, I mean, even worms and, um, and insects have glia. But that's a good question. I mean, hydra, I think, you know, so the evolution of the nervous system is fascinating. I think hydra that uh, being studied right now because they are sort of the first... You know, uh, they, they, are, they express proteins that are in the nervous system, but they don't really have a nervous system. So it's, um, yeah, but that's a good question. I don't, I don't know when glia came into, or even the different kinds of glia. Yeah, because even like fruit flies, they have, if they're, they have astrocytes. Uh, I'm not so, and I imagine they, they have other cell types that are, you know, analogous to the oligodendrocyte or the microglia, but I don't think they go by those names. Um, but again, I am not, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about fruit flies, unfortunately. Yeah, we, we have to, we have to get an evolutionary neurologist or neuroscientist mm-hmm. on to talk. Like, what well, came doesn't, first? Doesn't TiVo have somebody we can 
Tweeva? get on? Tweeva, right. Well, not we don't have a resident um, person, but <laughs> Naz and me are mainly virologists, you know. No, that'd be a fascinating topic. Yeah, I, I know a few people that could could help with that. Yeah, that would be great. Is it not true, like from a lineage way, uh, that um, astrocytes and neurons do actually come from the same kind of stem cells in, in the brain? So perhaps, so when they do split would be an interesting thing to find out, like from a phylogenetic tree, yeah. So, yeah, that actually, that is very interesting. Um, it's not even clear within one species now, <laughs> you know. They're, the kind of thinking has been that the, there's a neural stem cell population that is, that they're, you know, all clones of each other and that it's some sort of, there's an a, a intrinsic cell, like a timer, a clock that knows how many times a cell has divided and that after a certain number of divisions, it will give rise to a certain type of neuron. And then you go X number of divisions and it gives rise to, uh, you know, the other and uh, the upper layer neurons, for example. And then, you know, then to this side, this cell type and then to oligodendrocytes and then to astrocytes. Um, but there's uh, there's evidence now suggesting even at very, very early time points, like days, embryonically, days before you're going to see glia there already exist stem cells that have glial properties um so this is like blowing a hole in the kind of like dogma of um corticogenesis for example all right that's a good place to stop it's number 19 well we made it past 12 which is the critical podcast episode so it looks like twin is here to stay which is nice feels feels a Important gap. Yeah, you can feel, you can, by the way, there's a listener poll over at our uh, website. Why don't you go check it out? Uh, you can go to microbe.tv slash twin twin. And, uh, apparently there's, uh, if you put your email in, you get, you enter a drawing for some kind of prize. I don't know what Ori has in mind, but, um, <laughs> just answer the questions that would help us out. And also microbe.tv slash twin twin. That's where you find the show notes links to the things we, talk about if you want to send us a question or comment one of these days we have to do some email we're accumulating yeah. at this point yeah we almost have to have a, a, a whole show just dedicated to the emails I have, besides the ones that are in the show notes there's uh, about a dozen uh that i haven't put in yet so we have to tackle those but if you'd like to send us one twin dwin at microbe.tv if you like what we do consider Supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Jason Shepard is at University of Utah. Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Vivian, for that uh, Glia 101. My pleasure. Timothy Chung is at New York University Medical Center. Thanks, Timothy. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Jason. And thanks, Vivian. This was uh, very helpful. And I think this this week's episode this week's episode should be called Twake. This week in uh, Glia. <laughs> you know, I almost bought that uh, domain oh, yeah? name. <laughs> I was like, I gotta, I gotta grab this before, it, oh, before Vincent should, gets should. to it. <laughs> Spin off. Well, there is, yeah. a, there is a, um, there is a podcast called This Week in Google. It's Twig. <laughs> How about that? You're not going to be able to fight that. Maybe it should be Twiglia. Vivian Morrison's at Vanderbilt University. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you so much. I'm Vincent Rackin Yellow. You can find me at virology.blog. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon.